John Elefante is an American singer, songwriter, instrumentalist, and a very successful record producer. He is known for his tenure as frontman of the rock group Kansas, the founder of Mastodon, and the super producer of Petra. And as an artist, John Elefante credits include writing and singing lead vocals on three multi-platinum albums. And as a producer, his albums have earned numerous Dove Awards, four Grammy Awards, and 10 Grammy nominations. John Elefante's resume is so long that we would be here all day just to go through his numerous accomplishments. But we'll touch on some of that. And John is here with his brand new album, That Amazing Grace, and his new hit single, Stronger Now. So let's welcome singer-songwriter, producer, John Elefante. Welcome to the show. Hey, thank you. Nice to be here. Well, first things yeah. first. Well, you go right ahead. You have the floor. No, go go ahead. <laughs> well, first, well, first things first, John, your voice doesn't seem to age at all, and you still have a magnificent range, and when you sing, it takes me back to the rock music of the late 70s and 80s, and I want to know, did you find the Fountain of Youth? Not really, but but I will say that I had some I had some intense voice training when I was about 18 years old because I, I, I just lost my high range completely. I couldn't sing above an A natural and I took about two and a half years of very intense vocal training. And it gave me, a, well, I learned to completely re-sing because so, I was hurting myself the way I was singing. This man taught me to sing without hurting myself, learned a whole new technique, and it gave me about six notes on my range. Well, isn't that true with a lot of young singers? You know. Some of them just have the natural talent. Others, they have what it takes, but they need a little coaching along the way. Because like you said, uh, you know, you could end up injuring yourself. And I actually heard the same thing when I was talking to Lauren L. Harris. He said the exact same thing. He literally lost his voice for basically singing a little bit uh, incorrectly until someone came along to help him out. It, it's, uh, yeah, the singers, some singers are born with, the, with just doing the right technique naturally. And I envy those guys. One one that I could think of is Mickey Thomas from Starship. That guy sings in the stratosphere, man. He's just it just comes natural to him, you know. Oh and, my, yeah, I, I know what you mean. Me. But you know, you know, who were some of the singers back then that you kind of wanted to be like, or those that influenced you? Oh gosh, um, Lou Graham, Forner. Um, Singer from Bad Company, uh, Paul Rogers. Love Steve Walsh's voice. I thought Brad Delp from Boston. You know, all these 80s, 70s and 80s tenor singers, as you can tell, were my favorites. Those who, That's who I cut my teeth on. Yeah, you know, there was, um, you know, my gosh, Steve Perry. I mean, you know, some of these voices are just so iconic. And when I was listening, and I've listened, I'm going to be honest, I listened to your brand new album, That Amazing Grace, numerous times. And I'm, and I'm listening to each and every song, and I, it literally takes me back to the glorious days when rock music was the only thing people wanted to listen to on the radio. I mean, you got that magic touch. Well, I, you know, I, I try to not do things all programmed, you know what I mean? I'm not, I'm, I wouldn't put down programmed music. I mean, it's it's very popular now. I mean, I have a 20-year-old son that listens to that kind of stuff. But, and I just like, I like the good old days, man. I just liked it when you just bang it out, you know. And, right. uh, well, you know, well, I, I, I played well, a lot of clubs growing up. And I, you know, I grew up in California in the rock scene. And I guess it's just still with me. It'll never leave. Well, do you remember the days of California Jam? Yes. <laughs> yeah, that's when that was the glorious days when even Van Halen was an opening act. I used to see Van Halen open for a band called UFO about five miles from my house in Long Beach, California. Oh my gosh! Wow. My brother and I would, my brother and I would sit there and just go, "That guitar player is not human. <laughs> These guys have got to. They're gonna. They're gonna make it to the big leagues. I know it. Sure enough, they they certainly did." Well, yeah, I mean, I, I remember some of the stories where even uh, Black Sabbath, you know, Ozzy did not want them opening up for them 
because for him it was almost like how do you follow that especially with 80s guitar playing i mean those were the glorious days of rock and roll but i want to ask you with your new album that amazing grace what was the inspiration behind it it's actually called i don't mean to correct you but it's called the amazing grace oh the amazing grace i'm sorry so i'm sorry so uh no no, what's no, it? no, no problem it's a <laughs> it's a common mistake um <laughs> Now, what, what was the question? I'm sorry. Ward. What was the inspiration behind the new album? You know what? This record wasn't supposed to be made. So it's not like I got an inspiration and made a record. You know, the pandemic hit. A friend of mine had been sending me some music. I was stuck in, in, um, in, in Arizona for a few days. He said, why don't you come over to my home studio and let's try coming up with a couple of songs, you know? So I went to his house and we came up with some ideas. We didn't finish any songs. And about a week and a half later, it was like, everybody get home. They're going to shut down the country. And when I got home, we talked on the phone and I just started taking some of those ideas that we'd worked out at his house and started developing songs. And we didn't know what we were going to do with it. Oh, we're gonna be, let's just put out a little EP under some kind of goofy name. And uh, as it went on, he said, no, this is a John Lafonte record. I said, it's, yeah, it's kind of turning out that way. <laughs> I guess as soon as I start singing, it just makes it that, you know. And we were originally just going to do a five song EP and it turned into a whole record. And I told him, we need a budget, man. These records cost money. He goes, I know I'll pay for it. I said, no, 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 man. We, you know, we could do some kind of you know, crowd funder uh, funding raise you know, or something like that. He said, no, I'll pay for it, man. I, this has been a dream of mine my whole life to be involved with a record of this caliber with a singer like you. And, we went on and finished all 10 songs and the rest is history, I guess. Well, I think your album's going to make history because The Amazing Grace, I found to be very melodic sounding um, and incorporating with sounds of basically almost a rock symphony in a way. I mean, the music is absolutely fantastic. Well, thank you. You know, that's kind of, that's kind of what I shoot for. Um, I try not to make the same record every time, but. There's similarities that run through all of them, but it's kind of exactly what you just explained. It, you know, I like I like unexpected turns musically. That you know, you know we're writing right where you think you know where a song's going to go, it doesn't go. You know, and um, but uh, as you explained, is is exactly the way I like to write. Well, you know, I brought my wife into my office. I said, "Hey, you got to I want I want to play these tracks for you, and I, and I want to get your take on it because she has a music background and." And sometimes she has the ear where she can hear things that maybe completely pass over me. And uh, it was kind of funny because she said the exact same thing you did. What she, what she loved, she goes, I loved the twist and the turns. As, as the song starts, all of a sudden there could be a change. And there's unexpected uh, sounds and, and harmonies going through each of the songs and she goes nobody makes records like that anymore and uh she was highly impressed i mean i was because i was so excited i wanted her to listen to it because well i want to meet her and give her a hug <laughs> well, yeah absolutely because she you know sometimes i have to lean on her for some insights on some songs because you know i don't want to just lean on what i like and hear because i like to you know i come across as a fan and um I kind of lean on her for some of the technical side of things. And it, it was funny because um, we were sitting here together listening uh, to some of the songs and we were listening to your new single, Stronger Now. Mm -hmm. And pure stadium rock, little mixture of Boston, Striper, maybe a little bit of Night Ranger. Thought I heard a little overtone of Asia there, but it's literally one of my favorite tracks on the album. What's the? There's always, there's always a little Beatles sprinkled in too. I did, and you know what was <laughs> funny? Because you, since you brought up the Beatles, I was sitting there listening, and your your voice is so pure that I'm sitting there thinking, like, wait a minute. There's almost like a mesh of a little bit of Paul McCartney and John Lennon kind of mixed together into your voice that just makes this album just so unique and i'm gonna to have to give my wife chops on she goes this album is literally timeless when it comes to rock music wow that's a big compliment i appreciate that and, and uh 
you know, because that's what, I, that's what I was shooting for. So, you know, when I hear things like that, it makes me think maybe I hit the mark. You definitely hit the mark because it was funny because the first track that I listened to was City of Grace. And right. the moment it started out, I could, it took me back to a song uh, in, you know, what we would call contemporary, or I should say Christian rock back mm-hmm. in the, uh, I guess the the 80s, maybe the early 90s. And I literally heard, it's almost like Mylon Lefevre's praise him at the very beginning. You get that sense, you get that sound where you're entering the throne room of God when that song starts. That's that's kind of what we were shooting for, exactly. It was an introduction, you know, come on in, come on into the city of grace. And, you know, it, it, it kind of denoted that this might be a concept record, you know, and in some ways it is, you know. Yeah. And, like, but, like we talked about earlier, Ward, it was, this record was made during the COVID era, man. You know, we were all locked down. We didn't know what was happening. Yeah. We're all going to die. What's happening? You know, it was, it was a strange time. Well, did you find that, uh, you know, and I've talked to a lot of artists who, you know, right now they're coming out with brand new albums that were literally record, written and recorded during the pandemic. And even though it was kind of a, an uncertain, scary time for all of us, was there a sense of the ability to like take your time with the album and um, maybe getting it exactly how you want it before, you, you know, whenever you get to release the album, I should say. Yes, there really was. Uh, because a lot of my shows were canceled and my whole calendar was almost wiped out because nobody could rebook because they didn't know when this thing was going to kind of die down. And so I, I felt like I had a lot of time, yes, to, to, to do things and do things over, which, you know, a lot of times the record company's forcing you, we got to have this record. We got to have this record. I didn't have that kind of pressure. So um, I would go back and re-sing songs that I wouldn't normally do in the past, uh, rewrite some lyrics, re-sing a verse, and, you know, add real strings to a song that maybe I didn't think needed real strings, but after I heard it, it was like, wow, I'm glad I did that. Yeah, so, know, yeah, I got to do a lot more experimentation, yes. How has the record or how has the music industry and the business itself changed since, you know, from the days of you singing for, uh, with Kansas and then you end up being this highly successful record producer Owning your own studio, a massive studio at that. I know that it was upwards to 80,000 square feet in Nashville. And now people are creating their own, well, albums at home. But uh, and most, most artists today don't even have record contracts. Well, technology, cause, you know, because we owned, it was one of the largest studios in the United States. We saw technology getting cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. What would cost us to equip a room a million and a half dollars, we were seeing artists put in their house for under under a hundred thousand dollars. And I told my brother, I said, Man, this is getting scary. You know, because we had all this money invested in here. And it would, you know, when I say a hundred thousand, two years later it was fifty thousand. And then two years after that it was you can do the same technology for 20,000 at home. And it just it just took over the industry, you know, recording at home and not having to pay $1,800 a day to record in a big box studio. Well, you know, and I'm sure like many of us music lovers, I'm sure you saw the documentary on uh, Sound City. Is that what yeah. basically happened to, to you and Dino? Uh, yeah, in a sense, yes, yes. So um, now, I mean, do you find it, um, how, how do you, you know, for you, you know, and this is what I've found so interesting listening to your album, because I'm thinking, okay, singer, songwriter, producer, but you have the most amazing uh, talent for song arrangement. And I don't hear that too much from songs that I hear on the radio. I mean, you have a ta- you have a talent to me that's almost a lost art, and uh, so for you, 
looking at a song that you write, I'm sure that you look at it a lot differently than most people out there. Well, you know what? Because I don't read, I don't read music. I don't write music. I mean, I don't write it, you know, physically write it. Uh, I have very little theory. I guess I'm just, um, I'm just kind of a Neanderthal musically that just throws everything in a pot and stirs it up, you know, and without any training and without any right or wrong, you know. Um, and I think because I'm, you know, because I'm a classic rock artist, I don't, there's no formula that I have to commit to, you know, like I'm, I would never say anything bad about country music because I live in Nashville and I'm, I love country music, but there's definite, there's definite formulas that you stick, you know, if you stick to, you're going to have a hit single. Yeah. Um, you got to write about trucks and ex-girlfriends and, and beer. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> But no, there's, there's no formula that I have to stick to, which I absolutely love. I have no illusions of selling 10 million records. Nobody's selling 10 million records anymore. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's, there's big time artists that are lucky to sell a half a million now. When in the old days you heard of, you know, Taylor Smith, Taylor Swift was selling 10 million records, 12 million records. And I don't think that's happening anymore. Well, it's strange because even with, new upcoming artists coming up and you know and i'm looking at their instagram feeds and mm -hmm. you know the big deal for them is if they got a million streams on spotify i mean it's not even album sales anymore it's how many streams did you get but you know a million streams on spotify may get you 13 cents in royalties <laughs> you couldn't be more right but that you know that's just the way it is you know you can't put the genie back in the bottle it's that's that's just the way it is. Well, you know, you know and my, my goal, my, my goal really is, and I don't want to sound, you know, all melancholy, but it's, it's not about money for me. It's, you know, I have other places I, I could make money. Um, it's, it's really, it's just, it's really not about the money. If it were about the money, uh, my records would be completely different. Um, I probably wouldn't even be the artist. I'd probably find a young band and produce it if it were about the money, you know, well, let me ask you this, because you bring up a good point. So you have produced some of the most famous acts in the world. Was a lot of, with the way that you produced back in the day, was those songs motivated by money or were they motivated by just artistic ability? Well, in those days, record companies were much more involved. Very, very, very hands-on. They'd come in and they'd say, you know, send us what you're working on we don't hear a single we do hear a single this is a great one we do the second single now and whether it was about money or not you, you were being pushed to success no matter what it took and you know that's when record companies were really you know kind of calling the shots and in some cases they still are but you know i'm thankful to say not in my life <laughs> well, I want to get back to talking about your new album, The Amazing Grace. And one of the songs that I really fell in love with was Time Machine, which the moment I heard the first couple of notes, it brought me back to a little bit of John Waite when he was with the babies and just this, this sound of a little bit of ELO. It was like a total kaleidoscope of sound when it came to Time Machine. Did I get it right? That's yes. That's my favorite song on the record. But before I go on, I, I got I got to. Um, I'd be yeah. remiss if I didn't say, I do have a record company, Deco Entertainment, and Escape Music in Europe. But they're the kinds of deals where I can do what I want to do, and they they love what I do, and we're we're more of a team than them saying, oh, we need another single. We need, uh, we don't like that song. You know, they're not, they're not, you know, they're not standing over me with an iron fist. Okay, Time Machine. Um, it was the last song written on the record. And the song has no correlation to Back to the Future. <laughs> um, it, it That song has a lot of twists and turns. Um I mean, it's it's all over the place, and it's it's definitely my favorite. I think you nailed it. Well, yeah, but it works, and it's kind of funny because um, 
I actually had my wife listen to Time Machine, and she and she said the exact same thing you did. There's so many twists and turns. There's changes. You don't know what's coming up next within the song. And you know the only the only song that I can ever remember that gave us the twists and turns of not knowing what was next until we literally memorized the song was Bohemian Rhapsody. You know, because oh, it yeah. was it was we had no clue what was coming up with that type of song and Time mm. Machine. I love it. And ladies and gentlemen, you're going to fall in love with the same song. That's one of John's favorites It's one of my favorites on the brand new album, the amazing grace. And if you, if you love what I call pure rock, classic rock and roll music, you can't find a better album in 2022 than the amazing grace. John Litter, you've nailed it. I'll bet you tell all the artists that word, don't you? No, I'm just no. Kidding. Well, no, I don't. I don't interview bad artists, <laughs> but but well, you bring up a good point because I will listen to all, when I know that I'm going to be interviewing a recording artist. I will literally listen to their songs over and over and over again. And there's a few songs that I might not actually like, and I'm thinking, you know, where did that? Where is that one? But yeah. you know, you pick out the the gems, but it's it's really. What I love and I find so cool about your album is that, I mean, I remember the days, and, and, and this, this may age me a bit, but, uh, and ladies and gentlemen, some of you are going to know exactly what I'm talking talk about. John, you know what I'm talking about. When a brand new full-length album came out, and we knew that it was waiting for us down at the record store, and we mm -hmm. would go down there, put our money on the counter, buy that brand new album that... We can't wait to hear, took it home, put it on the turntable, and that was our afternoon, listening to song after song after song. Not listening to a single. Absolutely. It was from the first song to the 10th or the 13th song on the album, or listening to the six or seven and then flipping it over, listening to the other side. And That's why they called it AOR radio. It was album-oriented radio. And you have that perfect album. You know, Ward, you've said a lot of very kind things, and I really appreciate it. And and I appreciate you really doing the deep dive down in the record. I mean, you definitely, definitely have. Well, and your wife, thank her too. I will. Well, I want to bring up another song that uh, I I really like, and uh, and it's called "And When I'm Gone." Uh, mm -hmm. Can I call it a power ballad? Sure. I mean, yeah. <laughs> you know, I never thought that in this modern day that I would ever hear power ballads come back. And you did just that with this song. And I, again, it, great song. I mean, what was the inspiration behind that one? I'm glad you asked. Um, I had a piece of music I was working on. And I, I, fin I pretty much finished that piece of music. I wrote a melody over the top with no lyric. I was just scatting a melody the way I wrote most of my songs. And I, you know, the, during the pandemic, it caused me to reflect on a lot of things in my life for some reason. I don't want to sound all sappy, but it just, it just made me think about a lot of things that I hadn't thought about in a long time. And one of those was my, my mom, who was one of my biggest influences in life. And she passed some years ago and I felt like this is a perfect song to write about my mom. And when I'm gone, will you remember me? <clears throat> and my favorite line in the song is, um, I can't even remember. <laughs> um, will you remember me? Um, oh, well, gosh, I wish I had a look in front of you. Anyway, it was written about my mom who was, you know, I was very, very close to. I was the youngest out of three boys and kind of the baby, if you will. She de And she definitely favored me. My brothers were aware of that. But um, I felt like it was it was time to put some things down in words, how I felt about her. And I'm, I'm glad you asked. Well, it's a, it's a, it's a beautiful song. And, um, you know, it's funny. I, as I was listening to the whole album, a thought came to me. And... And I won't tell you directly because I literally thought 
rock music was dead. With all of the music that is out there, all of the music that they literally force on the listener. You know, they're not producing things that a lot of us like. It's almost like they're forcing some of these songs, which are absolutely horrible from a songwriting point of view. But I'm listening to your album, and I literally thought rock music was dead. But then I looked at it as, the Lord parts the Red Sea again, and John, you literally bring it back by yourself. That's how powerful I think this album is. Wow. <laughs> I don't even know how to respond to something like that big word. Well, well, no, because, you know, it's, you know, I'm, I was, a, I'm a huge fan of, of rock from the 70s, from the 80s, early 90s, um, you know, a lot of the hair bands that, that we all love, um, you know, even with some of the songs on the album, you know, I, I can hear a little bit of Def Leppard in there. And, um, and it's just an album that ladies and gentlemen, I, I can guarantee you this. And you know, you know what I say that, uh, when it comes to albums, you buy the albums, you don't download it for free. So this is an album you want to buy. And, uh, John, is this album available on vinyl? You know what? Uh, it will be in about six months. I don't know if you know this or not, but they're still back ordered. It takes you about seven months to get an LP manufactured. Yeah, That's I've heard that. Order. Yeah, I've heard that from Jack White. He was basically telling the record companies, "You better start bringing those vinyl pressing machines to America," and uh, because the backlog, the backlog for vinyl is enormous. I mean, it's a billion dollar business today. Oh, the one that there's a company in Nashville that presses LPs, and I mean, they were dying on the vine. Now I hear they've expanded like four times you know the albums are huge right now i mean people still like holding that big album in their hand and reading the reading the credits and seeing the people that played on the record and seeing the artwork up close as opposed to just on a little i mean when's the last time you tried to read the lyrics on a j card inside a cd i know i haven't because i you know cds were were great i guess for sound quality but to me, you can't beat vinyl. And in a way, for some of us, you know, even cassettes can still be cool. <laughs> you know, I remember the days of 8-track. Oh, so do I. <laughs> I, I, think I... Where, you always knew where that song was going to cut off right in the middle and switch to the other side. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I think I still ha I think the last two 8-tracks I saved just for nostalgia purposes was the Eagles Hotel California and probably the Bay City Rollers. So I know that I have those two eight tracks. You know, in in my room that I'm sitting in here is a lot of, you know, my memorabilia and goal records. And on the other wall that you can't see is all my, it's the sports wall. There's a bunch of football helmet. I'm a big sport, huge sports fanatic. And the next thing I want to do is I want to get about 16 eight tracks and frame them all together and then get a nice frame. I mean, you talk about, a, a you know, the talking point when somebody watched, Oh, look at that, man. Look at those eight tracks. And I have about, I have about 12 of them. I need a few more. I'm going to, I'm going to put it together. Oh man. That is they're, incredible. They're such a trip. Eight tracks are such a trip, man. Oh, they are. I mean, uh, I had one in my car, you know, I know what it was like to go from eight track to cassette to CD player. And, and now literally you plug in your, your iPhone and, and that's where the music comes from. But, my wife uh, just bought a. Oh, she just bought a Chevy, a Chevy Yukon. There's no, there's no CD player in it. Mm -mm. No, Nothing. not at all. I mean, my my wife had. It was kind of funny because, she. I think it was an. I think it was 2006, and uh, she had bought an Acura TL. And what was so funny is here's the stereo system with a CD player, and with a cassette player really yeah and and the only way wow. you could play the music off your smartphone was to buy the cassette with the wire on it that you plugged in and then plugged it into your phone so you could play the music through the system is the strangest thing i've ever seen oh wow but you have such an incredible resume what were some of your favorite artists that uh, you worked with and produced oh gosh petra guardian um uh, produced an Natalie Grant record. She's fabulous. 
Um, I really like doing, working on the St. Elmo's Fire soundtrack that my brother and I work with David Foster on. We had a song on that record. That was that was that was a lot of fun working with David Foster. Well, what's the process uh, when you're working with someone like that? I mean, my gosh, the, the iconic songs that David has worked on. I mean, what is it like working with someone like that? You know, he was he he was totally different. His his methodology was totally different than I expected. He would not. He did not want to step on our toes. I want you guys to do what you do, man, because I really like this song, and I don't want to make it something it's not. So he was sort of the rudder in the whole thing, and he and he and he made some great changes, cut live strings on it, and added things. But um, he was very kind of standoffish and didn't want to impose his will on the song too much. Well, I want to ask you this too, because, you know, a lot of people go back and they look at the history of Kansas and you were with Kansas for what, the last two albums? Isn't that correct? Well, they've had some albums since. Okay. And uh, can you walk us through a little bit of the change when, when it was you and then and Carrie and then David, when you left the band, did you, but did y'all leave at separate times? No, we let, we, we basically left at the same time. And I just felt when Carrie left that, you know, I, I won't say Carrie was the entire band, but he was a good, good portion of it. I mean, Carrie's music was, um, was mostly what Kansas was all about. And when he, when he left, it's just, I just wasn't that interested anymore in staying with the band without Carrie. Wow. So that's when I went out and, you know, tried, tried to flatten my own wings. And then, so, uh, Carrie and David, they started AD and then you ended yeah. up what becoming, uh, what the major producer for Petra. Pretty much. I think we did about nine or 10 records for them. Yeah. And, and uh, very, very successful at that. And I was really surprised because it was, uh, as I was going through your resume, I looked down and I see Mastodon and I'm like, wait a minute, the Mastodon. So I, I, I went to my son and cause he, he, he loves playing guitar, but both my kids love playing anything with strings on it. And, and I said, Hey, have you ever heard of Mastodon? He goes, Mastodon, you better believe I've heard of Mastodon. He goes, they're like one of the best rock bands there ever was. <laughs> so how did you go from Petra to Mastodon? Well, Mastodon was sort of an in-house um, studio band. But it sounded like a, it sounded like an intact rock band. But we we brought in the best players we knew, some of the best singers we knew, um, and it just really came together. Most of those songs were written for my solo records that I was supposed to make at the time, but I got so involved in producing and so you know distracted in that world that a lot of my songs were ending up on other people's records, and that's kind of Mastodon was where most of those songs ended up. Well, again, your talent is absolutely incredible. And, I, and I've interviewed a lot of people who, what I would deem extremely talented, but you stand on your own. You're, you're very unique. Um, and sometimes I wish a lot of, I, I wish you, do you, have you, do you go back to producing other people? Or are you just focusing on what you're doing? Um, sometimes, uh, a lot of young bands are, you know, they're choosing to self-produce because like I said, you can, now you can bring technology into your bedroom for $10,000 easy and make a very good sounding record. So, um, not doing too much outside producing. Um, I still do a lot of people call me to do background vocals and they call me to maybe help with some lyrics or something, but not that much producing really. Well, all I know is you're, again, like I started off with the interview today, John, your voice has never aged. I mean, you still sound like you're in your 20s. Thank you. That's a big compliment. <laughs> now, are you currently on tour? No, I'm not on tour. I'm just out doing doing dates. <clears throat> I travel with a band called Voices of Rock Radio that um, it's we all use the same band and we'll bring any, you know, any 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 three feature or three or four featured artists like 
might be myself, Jason Sheff from Chicago. It could be Randall Hall from Leonard Skinner, Kevin Shalfond, who was with the Storm, and perform a journey. And um, people love it because they get to hear all those hits. You know, we we all do about five songs each, and it's very successful. I mean, we do some casinos. We do a lot of corporate shows. Fantastic. Well, what is next for John Elefante? What is next? Well, I got more shows coming up. I'll leave next week for Buffalo, New York, and then go to California and just I'll have to look at my calendar because I don't, I only, I only concentrate on about two weeks out. Um, you know, I'll do some gigs and we're going to see what shakes out with this record. And I'm hoping to do, um, do some touring for this record. And where can everybody buy your brand new album, The Amazing Grace? Well, it's you know it's on iTunes, it's on it's on all the dot coms. Uh, the easiest place is probably my website. Now, um, I have links to both my record companies, so it'll just link you to those companies, and you you can buy it directly from them at johnelefonte.com. All right. Well, John, again, I want to thank you for honoring us with your time, your insight, and not only that, bring us some brand new, fantastic music. I'll do my best. <laughs> <laughs> well, ladies and gentlemen, head over to johnelefonte.com at the bottom of your screen and buy the new album, The Amazing Grace with a hot new hit stronger now and where get this ladies and gentlemen the amazing grace where we finally are blessed to have an album where every song on it is a hit and if any of you remember the days again going to the record store bringing it home and the latest releases sit there all day listening to it well ladies and gentlemen those days are back thanks to the wonderful talent of john elefante himself Stick around because we'll be right back after this. No energy, always fatigued. Has your got up and go, got up and went? Primrose Leafs Pro Max 365 helps to produce natural energy, increase endurance and stamina, improve performance during exercise, reduce pain from fibromyalgia, and is excellent for cardiovascular support. A doctor-designed, deliciously berry-flavored formula that's great for ages 18 to 99. Order Pro Max 365 and get the natural energy you've always wanted. Call 844-376-0007. Refuel daily with Pro Max 365 and get your life back. <laughs> 